episode is another uh, Hollywood mystery, um, an unsolved case. It cannot be categorized as a murder mystery per se because uh, it was never solved. It is uh, still considered an open file case as a disappearance and people are still wondering what happened to this particular actress. So her name is Jean Spangler and uh, her name might not be particularly familiar because she was not a famous actress. She was, I guess, a Hollywood background kind of actress, so she would do extra work. She was a dancer, had been in certain, um, you know, uh, I guess small bit parts here and there, but really was still trying to find her footing within the industry. And there were several people within this same realm. You know, you had this kind of like uh, A-lister type actors, B-list actors that were doing these smaller, um, campy kind of films. And then you had this group of C-list actors who uh, were around town. They were um, people who were part of the club scene, essentially. So they might have had a couple of bit parts here and there, but really what they were well known for was just uh, schmoozing and hanging around the clubs and the um, the dinner parties and things like that that they would have in Hollywood. And so they were photographed pretty frequently. A lot of times they would, you know, know studio executives and um, A-listers. They would be in those photographs. So as far as the the socialite kind of atmosphere is concerned. They were very active, but they didn't really have a major film resume to uh, back that up, so they weren't name uh, household names, but yet they were still uh, making the rounds, so to speak, and, you know, there might have been a variety of reasons. One, uh, they were, I guess, trying to befriend various people within the industry in hopes of making it within the industry. But I think after a certain amount of time uh, passes, they started to realize that uh, there was a little bit more to be had in this um, sort of underground uh, party scene there that was up and coming within the heyday of Hollywood. Uh, they would get free dinners. They might even become a, a sort of a side liaison for very big uh, people, you know, within the industry, very wealthy people, and their apartments would get paid for and various other things. And so they were not prostitutes per se, but they were in a way um, kind of selling what they could offer their youth and and good looks and, and whatnot. And in return, they, they got these little favors and maybe a few crumbs thrown in their direction in terms of roles. Uh, mostly, though, it was, it was just uh, background stuff. It was nothing serious. And, uh, you know, this was a, a, a strange kind of subculture that was emerging within the early days of Hollywood, where people who just, for whatever reason, the studio executives, uh, were not willing to back them or give them contracts, like big contracts, um, but they were still willing to use them within this capacity. And the thing is, they, because I guess they were invited to all of these events or somehow could get in, they had a lot of uh, photographs taken of them, and they're sitting at the tables with, you know, the biggest stars, the biggest producers, directors, whatever. And many times they were having, you know, full-blown affairs with these individuals, so they were definitely connected with them, but it was never something that was translating into uh, something that was benefiting their careers in any way. Um, you know, it, it was a strange sort of time in Hollywood. It's still kind of like that, um, but I, I think that it was it was definitely those were like the early days, and I think the other reason was once they sort of uh, 
reason. Because of that, I think the studio execs didn't feel that they could uh, back those people who were sort of making the rounds in this underground Hollywood club scene the same way they were willing to back um, like young ingenues who uh, looked very innocent and sweet and they could uh, somehow sell those people to middle America much more easily compared to people who are maybe just a year or two older than them. Literally, they were the, the same age, but for, for some reason, because they were hanging around these places, they seemed um, somehow tainted as far as the publicity machine was concerned. And it was a uh, catch-22 for a lot of these people because on one hand, they felt this was the only way to sort of get to know uh, individuals within the industry so that they could get these small parts and work their way up the ladder. But at the same time, the more they were photographed and seen in these sorts of environments, night after night, drinking or doing whatever, the a reputation had also started to develop. And the more, you know, boyfriends or girlfriends or whomever uh, they had within the industry, it was also starting to affect their sort of uh, public reputation. So even though the public really might not have known them, but I, I think the publicity machine within Hollywood felt that they could not cover for that sort of thing. And so they were basically almost like, uh, you know, uh, handed around amongst the various elite people within the industry, but they were never really given anything um, that would help them career-wise. On the other hand, you know, once I guess they became relatively known within this community, uh, they also sort of benefited in other ways. I think once they realized that, okay, you can't, uh, they weren't necessarily getting major roles out of this, uh, but what they were getting were uh, free dinners and getting into these fancy parties, getting uh, free clothes, and a lot of times they would become the mistresses or misters for um, these, you know, big, big, uh, wealthy people within the industry. And they would get free apartments and, and that sort of thing. And, and some of them, I guess, felt that that was okay. And they were sort of being compensated in this um, strange way. So this particular actress slash dancer, Jean Spangler, was one of these girls done it and she had done a couple of things had been in a couple of movies nothing major but she was part of that night scene in hollywood so let's see you know what she looked like so very attractive at this point she was like 27 28 so um she was a little bit past her prime as far as um the ingenue type roles that they might want to, uh, you know, when they're trying to promote and give new contracts to these young actresses. She had kind of passed that point. She could still work, obviously, but um, I'm not sure that anyone knew where to place her. And, uh, and um, dancers also have a slightly limited amount of time that they can be stage performers. So, and she has sort of reached that point, uh, but she was still part of that night scene, you know, going out at night. She had a lot of boyfriends and um, was definitely a popular girl. People knew about her. Okay, so I'm going to skip this little initial section and we will get to uh, her story. Um, there are a lot of ads on this particular site. I apologize. It's a lot of... Um, commercials that come up and so forth. Anyway, this is from the herbo.com. So Spangler was born in Seattle, Washington on September 2nd, 1923. By the age of 26, she'd already had a tumultuous life. Not long after graduating high school, she married Dexter Benner at 19, but filed for divorce only six months later, alleging cruelty. Despite the divorce filing, the two continued to see one another on and off for the next five years, and in 1944, the pair had a daughter, Christine Louise Benner. So here 
here she is with her daughter. She has, I, I was trying to think, who does she sort of look like in this photograph anyway? Maybe not all of them. She has a little bit of a look like um, Nancy Kerrigan. But uh, I think that was just this shadows were creating that effect. Okay, after the divorce was finalized, courts granted better custody of the young Christine due to Spangler's infidelity during the marriage. Benner also claimed that Spangler's hard partying lifestyle made her an unfit mother. Spangler didn't give up trying to gain custody of her daughter, though. Following a long and arduous custody battle, she became Christine's guardian in 1948, the year before her disappearance. At approximately 5 p.m. on October 7, 1949, Spangler left the Los Angeles home she shared with her mother and daughter. She left Christine with her sister-in-law, Sophie, telling Sophie that she was meeting with Benner regarding a late child support payment. After meeting Benner, Spangler would head over to a movie set. The actress's mother was visiting family out of town. So here she is, um, you know, hanging around the set. Definitely very attractive. She was a tall girl, kind of leggy, and, uh, you know, would uh, get people's attention. But, but not, you know... Uh, it, it just wasn't translating into major roles. On the way, Spangler stopped a store near her home. The clerk at that store is the last person known to have seen her. When Spangler didn't return home, Sophie reported her missing to the police. They then checked with all of the studios she'd worked with. None of them reported um, ongoing projects involving Spangler. In fact, none of the studios were even open on the evening in question. When officers questioned Benner, he told them that he hadn't seen her in weeks. Benner's new wife, Lynn, claimed that she was with him during the time of Spangler's disappearance. On October 9th, Spangler's purse was found near the entrance to L.A.'s Griffith Park. One strap was ripped and the cryptic, seemingly unfinished note was also left inside. Police initially suspected burglary, but nothing seemed to be missing from the purse. Sophie reported that Spangler wasn't carrying any money when she left. Okay, so this is the purse, and uh, the, I guess the letter is pretty clear. So it says, um, Kirk, can't wait any longer, going to see Dr. Scott. It will work best this way uh, while Mother is away. And that that's the cryptic note that was left. You can see the one strap that was ripped. Um... So just a regular common purse. Five dozen police officers, over a hundred volunteers, scoured the 4,107-acre park for any sign of Spangler, but found nothing. So you can see the expansiveness of this park. It is a huge property. Um, it would be virtually impossible to find anything over here, really, especially if it was buried or, uh, you know, covered up in some way. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You can also see that they don't have dogs with them, cadaver dogs or anything. Uh, I don't know if that was just this particular shot or if they used them at that time. But uh, it, it, it's just such a large space, and the way that the terrain is, you know, if something was going to be hidden here, um, they, they honestly would not be able to locate it. Upon Spangler's mother's return to Los Angeles, she told police that someone named Kirk had picked up Jean from their home a few times, but had always stayed in the car. When nothing to go on, but the mysterious note, police searched the L.A. area for anyone named Kirk who might have had any connection to Spangler and questioned nearly every doctor with the last name Scott. So this is the image of her mother uh, holding a big 
picture of Jean. Maybe a studio shot or a headshot. None of the doctors reported dealing with a patient by the name of Spangler or Benner, Jean's last name during her marriage. Then, some of things got even weirder. Investigators discovered that Spangler had cheated on Bennett with a man she called Scotty. She'd allegedly ended the relationship when Scotty had physically assaulted her and threatened her life. In another strange twist of events, actor Kirk Douglas phoned L.A. police while on vacation in Palm Springs to inform them that Spangler had a small part in a movie on which he was currently working. However, he added that she was merely an extra and he didn't know her personally. So let's read um, the article that they have on Kirk Douglas from that time. It's, it's kind of strange, you know, that this was the Kirk that, you know, was possibly referred to in the note. Um, and that he called investigators, but we'll get into that in a second. Okay, so it says Kirk Douglas question in Girl Mystery. Um, Hollywood, October 13th, movie actor Kirk Douglas questioned by police yesterday about the disappearance of Gene Spangler. Gay film extra said, I wish I could help, but I didn't even know the girl by name. Police have been trying to learn who Miss Spangler, 27-year-old brunette beauty, knew by the name of Kirk. The name was on a note in her purse found in Griffith Park Sunday, 36 hours after she dropped from sight. I told Detective Chief Thad Brown that I didn't remember the girl or the name until a friend recalled. It was she who worked as an extra in a scene with me in my picture, young man with a horn, Douglas said. Then I recalled that she was a tall girl in a green dress and that I talked and kidded with her a bit on the set, as I have done with many other people around on a day of shooting, but I never saw her before or after, and I have never been out with her. Jean Chief Brown said he questioned Douglas by telephone and was satisfied with his explanation of his acquaintance with Miss Spangler. The actor's attorney, Jerry Rosenthal, gave reporters a similar resume of the circumstances. Meanwhile, investigators sifted the ashes of a brush fire which swept five acres of Griffith Park near where the girl's purse was found. But police called off an earlier announced search by 200 officers of the 4,400-acre park, uh, where Sunday a park employee found the purse and its note. Police said a check of nine Hollywood doctors named Scott turned up no leads. The part-time film bit player and dancer, a pretty 27-year-old brunette, was seen early Saturday at a Sunset Strip nightclub with a young man, but observers were unable to identify him. Miss Spangler was an acquaintance of actor Robert Cummings, who told police he saw her last week on a movie set. Cummings said that she mentioned a new romance. Is it serious, Cummings said he asked. Not exactly, but I'm having the time of my life, her reply was quoted. Her mother, Miss Florence Spangler, returned yesterday from a trip to Lexington, Kentucky, but told officers she had never heard of either Kirk or Dr. Scott. A friend of Spangler's then informed police that the missing woman had secretly been three months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. She'd mentioned seeking out an abortion, which was then illegal. After speaking with staff and patrons of bars and nightclubs after Spangler frequently that you Frank uh, Spangler frequented, police caught wind of a former medical student who went by the name Doc and who performed illegal abortions. Investigators theorized that Spangler may have died due to complications resulting from the illicit abortion. 
abortion, but that didn't explain the presence of her damaged purse in Griffith Park. So here's another image of her. Police received reports saying Spangler was sighted in Palm Springs, California with Davy Ogle, who disappeared only two days after Spangler. Ogle was involved with gangster Mickey Cohen, who is similarly connected to Eli Lasky. Lasky was the former husband of Lynn Benner, Dexter Benner's new wife. So that's a very intricate connection. So her, the Spangler's ex-husband remarried, and he may happen to marry a woman who had formerly been uh, married to Eli Lasky. Um, so it was, you know, obviously she was connected with these gangsters from her previous uh, marriage, so that's kind of bizarre. Despite these connections, no coherent theory seems to explain their relation to Spangler's disappearance. LA police continued to search for Spangler for years, spreading photos of her around the nation in an attempt to track down any clues about her disappearance. Over the next few years, sightings were reported throughout California, Arizona, and Texas, and even Mexico, but none could be verified. Now nearly 70 years after she was last seen by friends or family, the LAPD still consider her a missing person. Her case file is still open, and the disappearance of Jean Spangler remains an unsolved mystery. So uh, this was a strange case, another one of these um, unbelievable disappearances that occurred within... Um, you know, Hollywood sort of, uh, I guess, part of Hollywood's night scene, their night, the nightlife over there, and she was a member of that particular group, but still very connected to these big name players like Kirk Douglas and um, all of these other actors that she knew, and and there were also studio executives that they didn't mention in here, but she was part of this. Um, she was kind of a party girl or club girl or whatever you want to call it, and. Uh, you know, she did have some strange family connections, too. So, uh, what actually happened to this particular girl? Um, when I was reading this, I noticed that she had a very similar look to uh, Elizabeth Short, uh, better known as the Black Dahlia. I haven't done an article on that one yet, but uh, I will eventually. It's a little bit more of an intricate case, but it was one that I had studied. Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth Short was apparently part of that, as well as these other actors that were within that same, you know, level. And uh, this girl possibly could have also been referring to that when she told her uh, sister-in-law that she was going to a night shoot. Um, you know, in Hollywood, they really didn't have those at that time. Um, you know, but I think it was a code word for this kind of party. The sister-in-law probably didn't know what she was up to, but maybe they had a little bit of a clue. But just the fact that that was the term that was used and none of the studios were, you know, open at that time, I think that that's probably where she was headed. Now, there are some interesting things. She said she was going to go and see her ex-husband, Benner, and uh, talk to him about a late child support payment. According to the Benners, she didn't even show up. Uh, the wife corroborated the story, but that, you know, doesn't totally make sense if she's telling his sister, Sophie is his sister, that I'm going to go and see Benner. Um, I think, I don't think that it would be a situation where she would make that up because the, it's too close of a connection, you know, the, the sister would find out that she had or hadn't gone or, or whatever. Uh, so I do think she went to go and see them. Now, it's suspicious why they said, no, she never came, we haven't seen her in weeks, we, you know, we have no idea where she is. Uh, that sounds a little suspicious if that was her plan to go and see them. I think that's what she did. Now, we don't know at what point she went to the store where the clerks are. Um, supposedly, she went after the Benner situation, but she could have gone before. Nobody exactly knows what time it was uh, that she went to the store. It has to have been during store hours, obviously. They didn't uh, have these 24-hour places, I don't think, at that time. So, um, you know, it's probably some point in the evening, and I'm thinking it was done after she had, um, I'm thinking it was done just before she went to go and see the, the banners. I think that's probably where she went. Now, the next thing is, what about this night shoot situation? Um, I, I really don't know what to make of that because, yes, there could have been a party or some sort of an underground kind of party. She might have gone there. Something could have happened to her, and then somebody wanted to kind of dispose of her or do that. But uh, at the same time, this girl was kind of uh, worldly in a sense that she had been hanging around this scene for at least... Um, eight or nine years at that point. So she knew it pretty well, the ins and outs and, and so forth. She wasn't like a complete, um, you know, naive individual. So yes, she might have been running around and, and going to these places, but I'm not 100% sure that something happened in that particular environment. It's possible. But I think the suspicious individuals in this case are the husband and new wife. One, um, they lost custody of the daughter. And I think that that was a major point of resentment as far as um, the husband and, and probably the new wife was concerned. She might have raised the girl from a young age and, you know, wanted to be that uh, parental figure. And they probably felt that sh this was... Um, you know, her real mother was uh, a wild kind of party girl and was not really, you know, the mid sort of, uh, she wasn't keeping up images as they would want. She would also be, she was also going to be an unmarried uh, woman taking care of a kid, and that was also an issue. So I think that the fact that she had just gained custody the year before, he had not paid uh, the child support for that last month. Um, and let's say that she went over there asking for money or, you know, asking for the last payment or whatever it was. Uh, there might have been some anger involved because, you know, the new wife especially might have felt that, look, forever they're going to have to be paying for, um, you know, Jean and then her daughter. I don't think they felt that her, the daughter was benefiting from these payments. They must have assumed, I can understand a, a new wife assuming that Jean is just buying, you know, new clothes or dresses for these.
these parties or whatever and that her mother is the one who's actually taking care of her daughter and uh, there, there must have been all kinds of issues and then the fact that uh, this woman used to be married to a gangster and strangely a gangster who was connected to a new person this uh, opal guy um, that Spangler was uh, also dating on the side uh, I don't know it's, it's a very strange connection to have that as a, a you know a, the last person that they were that Spangler had gone to see was somebody who also had this gangster connection and probably some anger and resentment towards her as far as what was going on um, and I don't know what kind of relationship she had maintained with Bennett the ex-husband but just the fact that they had this on again off again thing for so many years um, you know makes it a little bit of a concern I guess for a new wife uh, something I think happened in relation to the fact that she went to go and see see these two people and um, you know their just complete claim that oh we never saw her she never showed up we haven't seen her in weeks and all this thing I, I don't think that's true I think she did go over there and it's very possible that something happened a fight might have broken out um, and some you know incident occurred and the bag strap because it was not clearly a major tussle it was it was like just a quick pull that the strap broke um, you know the bag didn't look terribly disheveled and nobody knows what Jean herself looked like but uh, it's it's unclear exactly what happened it doesn't seem like it was a major struggle just from the one piece of evidence that's there now the note the note is kind of suspicious but it's it might not really be because here she is she's dating this guy Kirk Douglas sort of um, even though in the article the mother said that she did not know who this Kirk guy was in a later interview she said that on a several occasions somebody named Kirk had come over to pick a Spangler up but never got out of the car and uh, so you know it's probably Kirk Douglas and he didn't want to get out of the car didn't want to be seen or photographed or anything and uh, he you know had been seeing her on and off probably met her as an extra on that film that he had claimed to um, but you know his his uh, his thing about oh he never dated her and no, that's clearly not true he I believe that this was the Kirk that she was referring to in the letter um, and now she apparently was also three months pregnant and was seeking a divorce it's uh, very possible that um, the real reason for her divorce from Benner may have also been in something to do with an abortion that she might have sought uh, because in in her divorce uh, the reason that the person that she was supposedly having this affair with was named Scotty and then here we have this name again Dr. Scotty um, so I don't I think he couldn't uh, say the real reason for for the divorce um, but this was his way of kind of uh, making that claim it's possible that she had gotten an abortion during the, their uh, marriage and that's what might have ended the marriage and um, you know he labeled it as an affair but it's kind of strange that both of the I mean it could be a coincidence but I think that that's possibly you know what that was referring to and now again she was going to seek out this uh, this person Dr. Scotty to get an abortion um, now it's kind of weird that it you know you would have this beautifully intact letter uh, sitting in her purse now was that um, a forged letter I mean almost the way how, how clean the paper was it wasn't even folded uh, I mean you couldn't really see the fold marks maybe it was folded but you know it's strange to even be carrying that in your purse you know it might be something that would be in her desk or something at home but at, 
suspicious to me, even though it wasn't very clear, obviously, who, who this Kirk character was. At first, I thought maybe they, it, it was a forged letter from from the uh, ex-wife or, or whatever to try and push uh, the suspicion in this direction of this, uh, you know, affair that she was having in this possible abortion or botched abortion or something like this. Um, but then I thought about it a little more. If she was seeing Kirk Douglas and it was not a serious affair, even by her own account, when she was talking to Cummings, um, she said that she was having the time of her life, but that it wasn't a serious situation. Uh, so she might not have been that close to him. It was just more of a, a night scene kind of a deal. And, um, you know, because normally if you're dating somebody, she should have been able to call him and say that, hey, you know, this is going on. But then she's sitting there and writing letters to him. It seems sort of formal. And even if you look at the letter, there, it's like Kirk, uh, colon, and then the, it's, it's a strangely formal letter to be writing about stuff like this, even though she doesn't directly say what she's going to do. It, it's still sort of strange. So I actually think that she probably told him um, a little earlier on, by three months, definitely she would have known she's pregnant, but probably prior to that she would have known. Um, she probably told him and, you know, was maybe waiting to see what his reaction was going to be. You know, I don't know if he was married at that time. I think he probably was. Um, but, you know, what, what was he going to do? Was he going to say, oh, you know, I'm going to divorce my wife and marry you and, uh, you know, we'll have this whole lifestyle together or whatever. Um, I think she wanted to see where it could possibly go. But I think what ended up happening is that Kirk must have confided in somebody, must have conferred with someone, um, you know, saying that he had gotten into this situation. And uh, this decision was made by, by whatever means to cut, cut off the connection with this girl, because not only could she, you know, affect his reputation, um, that there had been cases in the past where these women had, uh, taken them to court and really the actor's careers were totally uh, done for as far as public opinion was concerned. And Kirk Douglas was a major Hollywood commodity. He was like a big brand, a big name. So um, I think the plan was to just stop seeing her altogether. Don't call her. Don't, you know, hang around anywhere, which was, I think, the reason that she felt she could only write a letter to him. And there was also like her phone number was written on top. It's almost like a how they make, you know, Hollywood resumes where you got your contact information on top. It, it was a weirdly formal letter um, as if he wouldn't have her phone number, those kinds of things. Maybe he didn't. I mean, I don't know how loose the situation was between them. But I have a feeling that she told him he stopped talking to her and the only way she could, you know, uh, get to him was through this letter. I don't think she had had the abortion at that point. She had not met with the Scotty. And I don't think that that's where she was going as far as this night shoot um, a situation that she was referring to, to the sister-in-law. Uh, because she had like a full week or so that her mother was going to be away. And that was probably when she was planning on doing it. So I don't think that this was from a botched abortion that had happened at night or something like that. There would also be no reason for her purse to be torn if um, it was from, you know, like going for this abortion situation and something went wrong and then the doctor got rid of her or something like that. Why would her purse be torn? Um, you know, they could have done it just to confuse the issue, but I, I don't really think that she had had the abortion at that time. I think that she was, you know, she t was wanting to tell. So I think she was probably, uh, just wanting to see what Kirk's decision was going to be. And, um, I don't think she had actually gotten the procedure done at that particular point. So, um... He clearly had cut off connections with her, though, the fact that she's writing letters to him rather than calling. And that, you know, she's left her phone number right on top, like as if it's a Hollywood resume or something like that. It's, um, 
it's it's a little strange. So I think possibly Kirk Douglas uh, was informed about her being pregnant, probably a little prior to that. Um, might have called his lawyer or call, you know even told his representatives or something like this. They am in this situation, and it's possible that they said, "Okay, let's we're we're going to take care of it." But the biggest thing is that you need to cut off connection with this girl. Stop talking to her. Stop going and seeing her, which is what I think he did, and um, you know completely had cut off connections from her. And I don't know if they were just waiting to see what she was going to do, or if the studio executives had come around and uh, told her that, look, you're going to have to get this procedure done, or if uh, something more sinister was in play that they thought maybe we need to get rid of this girl. I don't really think it would have been necessary since she was obviously willing to have the uh, procedure done. So, um... Yeah, I'm not totally sure that this was a hit called on by the, say, studio executives through uh, Kirk Douglas maybe calling them or something like that for help. Even though he was a major brand, they would have wanted to protect him. And, um, you know, I can understand that part of it, but I don't think she was very, you know, willing to. Uh, she seemed to be somebody who was willing to play ball. She might have wanted some money. She may, you know, there may have been some negotiations along those lines, but it doesn't seem like there had been that much communication with her since she's just directly speaking, you know, uh, communicating with Kirk through this letter. And if the studio people had called on a hit for her, um, I don't think they ever would have allowed that uh, letter to be left in the purse intact, you know, beautifully signifying uh, that it, it's somebody named Kirk and that she's pregnant and blah, blah, blah. I just don't think um, they would have ever allowed the suspicion to go in that direction if uh, if they had been the ones who did this. The person that's suspicious to me is the um, new wife. I think that uh, this new wife definitely had animosity towards um, Gene Spangler. I think Gene Spangler was very showy and gorgeous and, and definitely had a, a sort of hold on Bennett, not just because they had her daughter together, but the fact that they had this on and off again relationship for such a long time that, um, and, and that even, you know, his sister is taking care of their daughter and she's staying at the house. There's clearly an involvement that is in the new wife's opinion, never going to end. And in this, in addition to this, they are now having to pay child support, which I think she might have assumed that Jean is using this money to just, um, you know, support her uh, extravagant lifestyle of going to clubs, and everything seems exaggerated at that point. And the ex-wife, I mean, this uh, the new wife may have been getting little bits and pieces of information from her ex-husband because um, Jean is dating this guy named Opal, who is an associate of his, and, you know, the word might have been getting back to her as, oh, they went to this club, they went, you know, it, it just, everything just seems possibly exaggerated to this woman's perspective, and I don't know if um, she had also been part of raising uh, baby Christine for all of those years prior. It's possible that, you know, she felt she's more of a, a mother figure to Christine than Jean ever would be because Jean got Christine like at six or, or something. So for all of those years, it's possible that she had been taken care of by this other woman. And then now this child is kind of stolen from her that she was very attached to. And not only this, but they have to pay her, uh, you know, money. And it's possible that she felt a, she's never going to, um, you know, give this money towards the child's betterment. She's just running around and you know, running around the party scene and this and that. Um, I think there was some animosity there. And then you have the fact that they had not paid uh, their child support payment um, for that month. So they might have planned something, um, you know, it, thinking that, okay, this has to be taken care of. There's no need in even making this final payment. Um, something might have been pre-planned in terms of getting rid of the Jean Spangler situation.
speculation that had cropped up in their life, the fact that she got custody of her daughter only the year prior, she'd only been with her a couple of months, um, and, you know, and they'd only been paying for a little while, I, I think that there was some sort of intensity that was building up now this story that they never saw her that night or had not even seen her for weeks just seems uh, totally false because here is her the sister-in-law you know the sister of Bennett staying with the girl she's not going to make up a story and say that hey I'm going to go and see your brother um yeah, because he didn't pay the money, because that's too close of a family connection, you know, that she would find out if she was making up a story like that. I don't think she would make that up, especially when it's an it's issue of coming up with um, a lack of payment. So I think that she went there. It's possible that they didn't pay on purpose just to get her over there. Um, I don't know that the wife and ex-husband did this right at that scene, you know, right at the meeting, um, or had they called somebody in to do this, uh, you know, or what went down, but I do believe that that's where Jean went, she went to go and meet them. Now, where does this clerk situation fall in? They want to make it seem like after the meeting, she went to go and see this, uh, to the store and met up at the, the clerks are at the store there but you have to understand that you know these were not 24-hour places they closed early um it's possible that she went to that store before the meeting and uh you know that's when he saw her and then she went to go and see the bennett's something might have gone down over there um, and that's the reason that just uh, her bag is torn, you know, as if somebody yanked her. Um, and there's not like a tremendous amount more damage done to the purse. And, you know, a situation of like a robbery or just somebody who is not known to her, there might have been more damage to the purse. The fact that that note is so perfectly intact, um, you know, and just waiting to be revealed to the public so that it casts suspicion in this totally other direction. Um, I, I just feel that the ex-wife, I mean, this, uh, this new wife had the, you know, the connections to get this done that she might have asked for a favor it could have been a, it could have been a mistake it could have been a situation where it was an accident where she went to ask for money a fight broke out and she could have uh, it, it, I don't know maybe something could have happened in that argument that seems like a lot because this was a big this was a tough girl she was a dancer she was also pretty tall and you know could probably fight to a certain degree um, I don't know that the Bennett's, either the ex-husband or the new wife, could have physically would have physically done something to her right then and there. But I think that the ex-wife could have made a call uh, to her, you know, former associates or her husband or whomever, and said, "Hey, we have a situation. Can you take care of it?" Either it was pre-planned or it just happened that night. I'm not really sure, but clearly something happened there and the people that she was going to go and see you know who did have a motivation for getting rid of her are probably the most likely suspects it's strange that you know just the wife corroborating the husband is enough of an alibi um but it doesn't make any sense either why she wouldn't go to this location where she said she was going to go and um especially when the issue is money. Now, the other possibility I'm thinking is um, this night shoot kind of uh, code word that she might have been using for the club scene, whatever that she might have been involved with. Um, that could have also been a pre-planned situation where they knew, okay, she will go if she's asked to. Uh, maybe Opal or any of those people could have been involved because he also disappeared two days after she did. Um, so it could have been a call in to him that, uh, you know, somehow get her to come to some location at which she, you know, went to. Maybe it was a studio or, or an underground party or whatever. And that that was maybe the point when she was abducted and that's where it first ripped, where she was just sort of pulled into a car or a van or something like this. She definitely, this did not happen at the park. Um, I don't think she would have gone to a park, you know, like that in the middle of the night. I think that's just where the evidence was disposed of. But uh, this seems to be 
it's clearly somebody wanted to make sure that her body was not found, which it hasn't been. So there's some, I, I don't think this could have just simply been done by the Bennets themselves. I don't think they would have been able to just carry out something like this. But her connections, um, Opal and Lasky and all those guys, yeah, they totally could have done it. And th this seems like something that they might have done. And then this added touch of just having one pristine piece of evidence left right then there, um, you know, pushing it in this other direction. If it was a hit called in by Douglas or any of his associates, they never would have left the note there. So it seems like it's the ex-wife somehow. She seems to be the one who has all these connections in the other uh, articles that I read um, where she's given in interviews and stuff. There is some sort of underlying animosity in terms of the way that she describes Jean, meaning she felt that she was like a showy girl or a, you know, a party girl, whatever. I, and clearly she did not feel that she was a mother figure to um, this little girl, kind of insinuating that, she, you know, she would be a better mother than Jean ever could be without really saying it. So uh, I think that that's probably what was going on. And then the decision was, hey, there's no need in paying her if we're going to get, you know, take care of this situation. Um, and, and that either was the lure to bring her to them or um, it just happened to go down that night for whatever reason. Or the second issue is that uh, maybe they were trying to do a final negotiation with her that, hey, give us Christine back. And maybe they would have called off the hit if she had agreed to do that. Um, and maybe that was why they wanted to meet her and that it was the second place that she was going to go to. Um, where it actually happened, meaning that they were still involved, had called and planned everything, but maybe they just wanted to see her right before and see if they could negotiate with her a little bit so that they wouldn't have to go through with this whole thing. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I just, I feel that there's some, something suspicious about the ex-wife and all of her mob ties, and then the way that the body was taken care of um, in this fire, and then the way that the evidence was just left just enough so that it is pushed on this other person. Um, that seems like a little bit of thinking is involved, and there's a little bit of, uh, you know, somebody who's adept at this kind of uh, business. So uh, it seems like something like that possibly happened. There are other options, too, like, you know, something weird could have gone on uh, within a club or, or wherever she was supposed to go, and then... You know, maybe they wanted to take care of the take care of her. Maybe an accident happened, but then I don't see why the purse would be ripped in that situation. Um, and again, even if it was at the doctor's situation, I don't think that the purse would be ripped. The ripping of the purse kind of makes me think she was yanked at some point um, in a purposeful way. And um, as far as the um, you know, procedure was concerned. I, I really don't even think she had had it at that point. So it was, uh, it was just a situation where they totally wanted to get rid of it, any evidence of this girl. And I think that's what they did. And then to have, you know, stories come out later about Opal uh, being in Mexico with a girl that looks just like her. And, and uh, I don't think, I mean, he could have been with a girl that looked like her. That might've been his type of of person, but um, I don't think it was ever going to be her because I don't think she would have fought for her daughter for so long just to get her back and then run off with a gangster. I don't think she would have done that. Um, it was it was seems to have been a situation where the uh, new wife happened to have these connections where somebody that was threatening her in a way or she felt threatened by. Um, and, and probably resentful towards that she had the means and ability to uh, get rid of her. And I think that that's probably what happened. She had become um, a person that was uh, not considered necessary as far as this new life that these uh, people wanted to live. And they, they felt that she was going to be a burden for the next, you know, 
know, 10 or 15 years as far as these payments and all of this other stuff was concerned. And uh, I think that that's probably what happened to Jean Spangler. Um, all of these tales about her being seen in this location, I don't, I don't think she would have run off and left the daughter if she wanted to give the daughter back you know, to them, she would have done it. I, you know, I don't think that that was, that had anything to do with it. I don't think she ran away. Um, she definitely was taken care of and it was taken care of that night. And I have a feeling this was a pre-planned deal. Um, something to do with the Bennets and their, you know, aggressive, um, the, the anger that and animosity that they might've felt towards her, especially once she won custody of the daughter and were, was then going to require payments from them. I think that that's probably what spurred this situation to begin with. And the Kirk Douglas thing was just a sideline, you know, thing that happened to work, I guess, in their favor, because it, it pushes suspicion on him that he might've, you know, had the connections or money to um, get rid of a girl like this or, or a liability like this. But I just don't think he would have ever gotten his hands dirty directly. And if it was somebody that he had called to do it, they would have never left the suspicion, you know, directed towards him. Um, this this seems to be somebody else. And, and the, the, the penance are the ones that seem to be the people who, are the most suspicious as far as I'm concerned. Okay, guys, so this was the um, case of the disappearance of Jean Spangler. It's still an open case, but I, I think we we definitely can, um, as far as we're concerned, uh, assume that something had happened to her the night that she went missing. And um, it's a sad case. She's a, a pretty girl, a vivacious girl, but, you know, I think her lifestyle had not settled to the point that she was going to be able to handle everything else. I think she was just trying to get to that point, but it had not happened, you know, and she was just involved with so many different things, and people were, um, you know, there, there, there was just a lot of anger with these outside individuals, um, and, and I think that uh, the custody battle was at the heart of this, uh, as far as that's that's kind of what I think happened to her. So anyway, um, sad story, but it's it's definitely an interesting case, the mysterious disappearance of Jean Spangler. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will talk to you again next time. Okay, guys, have a great night.